Welcome, everyone. I hereby call the meeting to order. This is an open meeting of the Broadcasting Board of Governors being held in compliance with the Sunshine Act. A digital recording of this meeting will be available for on-demand viewing on the BBG website, www.bbg.gov. Joining me today are Governors Crocker, Kempner, and Cornblue. Governor Aaron is on the phone. Let's start, as we usually do, with uh, threats to press freedom. We continue to see press freedom decline around the world. Every day, our journalists risk their lives and their livelihoods to report the truth. Since we last met, there have been many disturbing attacks on our journalists and their families. Let's take a look. Around the world, journalists risk their lives and livelihoods every day to report the truth. In recent months, BBG Networks and the journalists who work for them have experienced dangerous and systematic threats. In China, relatives of six U.S.-based journalists with Radio Free Asia's Uyghur service have been detained and disappeared by Chinese authorities. These relatives, living in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, are being held in re-education camps, which act as open-air detention facilities holding thousands of Uyghurs at a time. In Cambodia, pressure continues and restrictions are increasing after media crackdowns that led to the closure of RFA's Phnom Penh Bureau in September. Two former RFA journalists, Guan Chin and Sotheran Yang, were arrested in November and charged with espionage. They have been denied bail twice, and their families are worried about the appalling conditions in prison. The government has also stopped renewing Voice of America's press credentials, and VOA Kamai stringer Rick C. Hall was recently escorted off the parliament premises. In Vietnam, two RFA contributors continue to be held. Nguyen Nhoc Gia, a blogger and contributor to RFA's Vietnamese service, was sentenced to a four-year prison term with another three years on probation for carrying out propaganda against the state and videographer and contributor Nguyen Van Hoa is being held for, quote, abusing democratic freedoms to infringe on the interests of the state, an offense that carries a maximum sentence of seven years in prison. In Nigeria, the wife and son of VOA Hausa stringer Nasiru Yakubu were kidnapped on February 28th when attackers stormed their Kaduna home. A neighbor who tried to help was killed in the process. Thankfully, on March 2nd, Mr. Yakuba confirms his family was released. In Burundi, VOA Central Africa stringer Eloge Kaneza learned he had been added to a kill list. He has since been evacuated. In Egypt, the state-run media have led organized attacks on local and foreign press, including al -Hura. In the attack, they've tried to discredit the network by erroneously describing it as a television channel sponsored by the Pentagon and intelligence agencies. In Ukraine, Mykola Semena, an RFERL contributor, continues to be prohibited from working as a journalist after he was convicted of separatism last year. On December 18th, the Russia-controlled Supreme Court of Crimea upheld those charges while Semena still faces a suspended two-and-a-half-year prison sentence, the court shortened from three years to two the period during which Semena is prohibited from working as a journalist. Blogger and contributor to RFARL's Ukrainian service, Stanislav Aseyev, has been missing since June 2nd, 2017. He was forcibly disappeared by Russia-backed separatists. He has not been heard from since. Elsewhere, RFERL Ukrainian service reporter Serhii Nuzhneko was pepper sprayed by police. An RFERL Ukrainian service correspondent found his apartment vandalized, and a Ukrainian stringer was detained and interrogated by border guards. In Pakistan, the Islamabad Bureau of RFERL's Radio Mashal was forced closed earlier this year after government intelligence accused RFERL of airing programs against the interest of the state. Authorities have tried to force Radio Mashal staff to make statements against RFERL. And VOA reporters in Lahore, Peshawar, and Islamabad are taking precautionary measures after a variety of threats have come in. 
in Turkmenistan, Saparamed Napaskuliev, a photographer and contributor to RFARL's Turkmen service, continues to be held after he was detained by agents of the National Security Ministry on July 7, 2015. No one has seen or heard from him since. I know I speak for all of us here today when I say the harassment of all journalists and their families has to stop and we call for the immediate release of our jail, jail journalists and their families. Let us now turn to today's board business. The presence of five or more governors satisfies the board's quorum requirement, a quorum being present. The board may conduct business based on majority vote. On February 23rd, the board received by uh, email materials for the consent agenda, which allowed sufficient time for all governors to review the agenda prior to this meeting. We did not receive comments from any governors. This month's consent agenda is at tab 6 through 12. At, at this time, I'd like to ask if any governors have any comments on the consent agenda. Not hearing any, do any governors wish to move for the adoption of the consent agenda by the board? Great. Great. Okay, so we have a okay, motion by Governor Crocker, seconded by Governor Kemper. Uh, all in favor, say please say aye. 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 Any objections? Okay, great. Okay, now we turn to public comment. The board permits members of the public who register to attend our open meetings the opportunity to speak up for up to three minutes. I understand Ann Noonan would like to make remarks. Uh, Ann, please come to the table and introduce yourself before you speak. This is Ann Noonan with the Committee for U.S. International Broadcasting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Noonan, and I'm honored to serve as the Executive Director for the Committee for U.S. International Broadcasting. CUSIB has no budget. We are an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization that continues to support journalism for media freedom and human rights. Our organization was formed seven years ago when the BBG planned to eliminate Cantonese and Tibetan services. This year, CUSIB is asking again for assurance by the BBG governors that the budget will not include any reduction or elimination of Voice of America's Mandarin, Cantonese, and Tibetan services, including shortwave and medium wave radio, television, and internet services. We would like to know the status of BBG management to finally hire a VOA Chinese branch chief and projections about the hiring process for the new Cantonese and Mandarin service chief. This will affect the operation and long-term planning for both the VOA's Cantonese and Mandarin services to counterbalance China's propaganda machine. People in Hong Kong and China know the VOA brand name and know how VOA represents the opinion from the United States. It is important to remember that Voice of America broadcast services are separate and distinct from the surrogate broadcasting provided by Radio Free Asia. As China's government continues to commit unspeakable crimes against Tibetans and Uyghurs, it is necessary for Radio Free Asia's funding and support to increase. I'd like to speak a little about concerns that may exist regarding any possible conflicts of interest that could impact decision making and the quality of content broadcasting here at the BBG. These include how decisions are made about who should be interviewed and who should be hired or fired, and about how much funding from the overall BBG budget is taken from journalists and put into administrative processes. If there are any BBG governors or person in management at the BBG who have business investments in China who are accountable to shareholders invested in China, or whose spouses may have investment in China, I wonder if you will refuse to turn a blind eye to the oppression and genocide against Tibetans and Uyghurs. While Tibetans and Uyghurs are subject to unspeakable genocidal crimes, and one of their only voices is Radio Free Asia, are you too aligned with the authorities who allow these atrocities to occur? Are any of you unwilling to criticize China's government because of its economic power. Sadly, I believe that what the Uyghur and Tibetan people are experiencing now is the future that China's underground Catholics face. Are any BBG governors and management unwilling to distance themselves 
from Islamophobia, which is rampant in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, where China's government has detained hundreds of thousands of innocent Uyghurs in detention camps, arrested RFA sources who are suppressed and targeted for daring to speak out about human rights matter and the loved ones of Uyghur journalists who work at RFA. CUSIB applauds Chairman Weinstein for his public comment stating, quote, the cruel detention and harassment of family members of Uyghur service radio free agent journalists must end, end quote. My call to action to you today is for one of the Board of Governors to make a motion today to be seconded and approved for a resolution appealing directly to the United Nations to address the issue promptly and seek assurances from national Chinese government that there be no further persecution of RFA journalists and their families, and that the whereabouts of RFA family members be made known as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ann Noonan, for those comments. On the last item, we are working on a plan with regard to the United Nations. Uh, and thank you for flogging that. Thank you for your interest in our work. And thank you for the questions you raised. And we will get back to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now I'd like to turn it over to CEO and Director John Lansing to give a brief report on agency operations since our last board meeting. John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governors, on February 12th, the BBG unveiled its 2018 to 2022 strategic plan titled Information Matters, Impact and Agility in U.S. International Media. It was timed with the release of the President's FY 2019 budget request. I encourage all of you to take a look at it. It's, the plan is on our website at www.bbg.gov. It's a comprehensive roadmap for moving the agency forward in the next five years, including significantly increasing our audience reach. Information Matters outlines key goals and objectives for accomplishing our mission of informing, engaging, and connecting audiences around the world in support of freedom and democracy. While we're an independent agency and where editorial decisions are independent, we've chosen to align the plan with the NSC's new national security strategy and it supports President Trump's management priorities of effectiveness, efficiency, and accountability. The plan also incorporates the five priority initiatives that I've outlined for the agency. First, focusing on key issues and audiences with special emphasis in Russian, Mandarin, Farsi, Arabic, and Spanish. Second, maximizing our program delivery agility. Third, enhancing the strategic cooperation between the networks through the ICC, the Inter International Coordinating Committee, which you'll hear from in a minute. Fourth, improving accountability and our measurement of our impact around the world. And finally, targeting more public-private partnerships. The BBG networks are operationalizing our strategic plan through their own engaging content on television, radio, internet, and increasingly on social and mobile platforms, and also by working closely with media partners around the world that bring our content into local markets, establishing important connections to critical institutions that support civil society and democratic principles. So now I'd like to invite the ICC, the heads of our five networks, to report on the progress they've made in key strategic areas of the BBG and I'm really happy to begin with Amanda Bennett, the director of the Voice of America. In February, Voice of America debuted a new show called Plugged In with Greta von Susteren. The show examines various aspects of United States policy by interviewing policymakers and discussions with opinion shapers. This has augmented the number of editorials and interviews provided by senior administration officials to the BBG networks. So Amanda, I'll invite you to take over and introduce Greta. Thank you, John. And uh, I'm sure most of you know Greta. She's had a very distinguished career at uh, many of the major cable news uh, operations, Fox, CNN, MSNBC. And she is here um, because of her passion for the work that we do. She is wor working for us pro bono. She is giving her time for a weekly program partly because of her passion for the mission, and also because the type of journalism that she favors, which is straightforward, neutral, non-political, 
issues oriented, serious journalism is the kind of journalism that we here at Voice of America broadcast every day. So we find that we are a complete match in, in what we want to do. Her issues oriented programming has been be, being broadcast around the world and we look forward to many more. And, and uh, just to mentioning that some of the interviews that she's had recently, besides doing issues oriented programming like the Rohingya issues, she's also gotten major interviews on, on issues like North Korea and, and gotten Ambassador Nikki Haley, uh, uh, Senators uh, Lindsey Graham, Dick Durbin, Ben Cardin, uh, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, Vice President Mike Pence, all, and, and just recently that will be airing shortly, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross talking about tariffs. And as Greta said, who knew that tariffs could be so exciting? <laughs> I, I'd like to just uh, stop for a second and show you a little a short sizzle reel, and then I'll turn it over to Greta to give a few words. The President has tweeted that he has a bigger button than Kim Jong-un. Um, is he playing with fire? President Trump made it clear, America will not be bullied. America will not be threatened. If those sanctions don't work, then what? Well, what we have to do is prepare for a broad range of options for the president, and those include military options. At the end of the day, we still have nuclear missiles in North Korea that they continue to threaten the United States. I mean, how much time do we have? Not a whole lot. You saw the CIA director, Mike Pompeo, said maybe within a couple months. And today, we dive into what the United States is calling ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya people in Myanmar. But for many survivors of sexual violence by Myanmar security forces, the depression and post-traumatic stress disorder have lasting effects. First of all, just sort of set the stage about how many camps are there in the area? We were one that has the estimated on 25,000 acres around 600,000 just on that one camp. Uh, it's incredible. The people are living on top of each other. About 60% of all the water in the camp is already contaminated. The Trump administration just finished its first nuclear posture review. It's the first nuclear review since 2010. Is anything changing with our nuclear weapons? Yes, Greta, there are actually uh, two changes ahead, drawing both critics and supporters as the Pentagon works to modernize what is called the country's nuclear triad. When would the U.S. use nuclear weapons? We would only use nuclear weapons to protect our own vital interests in extreme circumstances. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Christ belongs to all people. United States among the majority of countries with no state religion. Where is the line when we try to use diplomacy to try to change like, you know, China's uh, persecution or other nations persecution of religion? Where do you draw that line? Well, the very first place we have to begin is with a good example here at home. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice of America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. Thank you for being plugged in. Thank you. Now, Greta. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here, um, but more importantly, um, the opportunity to be at Voice of America. Um, it's different. It really is different. It's old-fashioned journalism. And I've had, look, I've had, you know, wonderful years at many of the other networks, um, and it's been fun. It's been a little rock and roll. We've had some interesting changes in, at all of them. Um, but fundamentally, I don't see journalism as a sport. Um, I see it as a search for facts and information, facts however, however they may fall. You know, it's, I don't make the facts, but I'm at least trying to, to find them. You speak about this being important, and um, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm one of the few journalists in, from, coming from a commercial environment who has traveled the world. I don't know, I, in part because I used to hitchhike with NGOs, and that's the other, because look, um, most journalism is commercial. And they have to worry about the bottom line. And it is a fact that it's a lot cheaper to put two people in front of a green screen and sit in a studio and talk about things to send people out around the world. And um, the stories that, that we're reporting on um, so far are plugged in. I've been to these places. I've been to North Korea three times. I've been um, to, I've just recently was in Bangladesh at the Rohingya camp. I've seen this stuff. 
And, um, you know, I'm just, you know, Amanda tells you I'm here free. I'm worried you're going to start charging me. You know, it's, <laughs> I'm just glad it's like, you know, I think that's accepting a gift. The government can't do that. Um, but I, I always tell my friends, they say, well, what's Voice America like? And they're all green with envy, you know, because I mean, everybody really does want to do this. I mean, all the journalists I've worked with every place else, they want to be able to do this. I mean, who wants to have to talk to, toss to a commercial to advertise, whatever, you know, so people really want to go out and investigate. It's why people get into this business. It's to, it's to go out and, and put a spotlight on the things um, that, that really matter in life. But I always tell my friends, I say, what's it like? And I always say, well, I think I'm the only journalist in the building who can only speak one language, you know, uh, which gives you sort of the breadth of the experience. I, mean, I learned so much just in, you know, when I get out in the makeup room and I had these journalists come in from these different services and, they, and I say, where are you from? And they tell me where, where they're from. And I go, really? And then I start to ask questions, whether it's, you know, the Afghanistan service, you know, you know it's, um, and so this to me is a, um, this is a, a privilege um, to be here. And um, I really, you know, I really appreciate the fact, the way, the way the, it's set up is that um, I, I, I've come from, when I left CNN, um, it was because they had great upheaval. It was when AOL came in and turned it upside down and um, and and uh, and just as a natural change when something changes, I can tell you, that, um, it has taken CNN years to to deal with that because it is so disruptive. And I, I urge the board that there, you know to it's it's none of my business, but there's a big difference between support and intrusion. <laughs> and um, and you know the the they have wonderful journalists here. And um, same thing with, with Fox News. I left Fox News when they had upheaval. Um, what really matters in a journalism environment is that we have stability. And that there are no surprises. I mean, the problem it's you know at both CNN and Fox is that after you have upheaval at the top, when they switch things around for whatever reason, is that you no longer spend 100 percent of your time doing journalism, but you spend 75 percent because the rest of the time you are trying to figure out what's going on in the building, and that's a huge distraction and it distracts from you know what you can do is because and these are very you know, I'm telling you I met these journalists I've been I'm you know, I, I'm like a stalker in the newsroom uh, meeting these you know journalists and talking to them. Um, and just one, one other last thing is that if you have any doubt how important Voice of America is, I don't know if you've, how, how much you've seen, but it is so important because the world doesn't, doesn't know the United States, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's just nothing, you know, nothing like being able to, to, you know, to go around the world and, and open that door and show them because there's a lot to be said for the First Amendment and all the other rights that we have here, even from looking at your video. But thank you for your time. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Let me just first say for the board just uh, how delighted, honored uh, we are and touched by uh, your uh, very strong belief in, in, in the Voice of America and in this important agency. It means a huge amount uh, to all of us around the table, and we're deeply grateful for your service and what you've done to raise the visibility and the incredible interviews you've done. It means a lot. Let me see if the governors have any questions for you. <laughs> I just, I, I want to echo what Ken said. I think we're very, very lucky to have you and the kind of stature that you bring and the kind of interviews you can get and, and just your, uh, you as a spokesperson, I think, it, it, as you just demonstrated. It's really eloquent. I just want to give you a chance to talk about something I talked to Amanda about as you were coming in, which is just what you guys were talking about, that to have an issue-oriented uh, program uh, um, when it's in this interview format, when so many of the newsmakers in the country right now are, you know, from one party, how do you go about demonstrating that, um, you know, that that you're that you're bending over backwards to be nonpartisan, covering all sides? When you get one interview at a time, maybe, and when so many of the newsmakers are of one party, like, well, how do you think about doing well, that over time? Uh, two things: one is to buy your questions. You know, you ask the questions and you challenge them. That's one way. And you can do it without yelling at them and pounding them on the head. You know, you can do that. You can ask this point of questions. Um, look, you know, the, there's no question the media is polarized. Everyone thinks that if you're at Fox News, you're a right wing nut. If you're at MSNBC, you're a left wing nut or at CNN, I don't, I don't know where. But I've been at all of those. And I can tell you what my inbox was like at all those places. At Fox, the left, um, the you know, the left would send me horrible things. At MSNBC, the right would send me horrible things. But this to give you an idea is that when I was at Fox, I had eight overseas trips with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, a Democrat. Nobody at Fox got Democratic guests. Likewise, when I was at MSNBC, I had Vice President Pence, I had Speaker Paul Ryan. Is that you know I'm able to get those because I think 
what they know is that I don't see this as a game. I, I, you know, I want to challenge them. You know, if the facts are bad for them, that's their problem, not mine. But at least they're going to have a chance to be heard. They're going to be challenged. Um, but I think you know, it, it does take time always you know, to build an audience. But I think here, with, with the stories we're doing, I've actually been to these places. When I talk about the Rohingya, I've actually walked the camps. I've seen you know, the people who have cholera in Haiti. I've been to the, you know, I think, so I think my experience lends credibility. But if you think that, you know, I, mean, I don't think, but I think everybody comes with, with a bias. I hate animal cruelty. So, you know, if I do something on elephant, on trophy hunting in Africa, you're probably going to hear my bias, you know, because I, I think that's sort of human. Um, but it's, it's a willingness to, to go after the facts. And, that, and that's why I'm here. It's like, it isn't the commercial pressure, it's sort of the, the uh, sort of the des desire here just to tell you know get it out there you know tell it tell it how it is whatever it's like just tell it like it is. Anybody else? Square. I hope you take that in the spirit in which it was meant. That I just think that this is something we just all have to be super upfront about is that we are um, to be new to, to to go after the news. You have to break some China, and we just want to continually but talk about. You know how we're doing, what we're doing, and I think I think it, we're really lucky to have you here. I think if you didn't, I'd I'd wonder. You know, it's like you know I appreciate that. In fact, you know, it's always like an you know it's it's a work in progress. There are going to be times when I say things that you really like and say things I really don't that you don't like, and you know, call me. You know, because you know what, I'm not always right either. I've been around the block enough to know that I don't always get it right. Well. Go ahead, Ambassador Crocker. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you and uh, welcome aboard. It's really great to have you here. Uh, one tremendous asset we have that no commercial entity in this country has is this vast network of local bureaus out in the world. Um, so I would assume that part of what you'll be doing here is not just having someone up against the green backdrop for a little studio interview. You're going to be connecting to our journalists all around the world uh, to, to bring a perspective that absolutely no one else can do. So, I, haven't, I mean, I've, I tell you, I'm getting my feet wet trying to learn this organization. It is huge. It's, it's all over. It's every nook and granny of the world. Okay. Leon, are you uh, looking to get into this conversation? <coughs> Maybe not. Okay, Amanda, anything else? Okay. Greta. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I want to turn it over now to our president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Tom Kent, who will demonstrate some of their coverage around violent extremism in Central Asia and the Balkans and the upcoming Russian elections. Tom? Uh, thank you, uh, John. Good afternoon, governors. Late last year, RFERL started two new projects on extremism, one in the Balkans and one in Central Asia. Both aim to engage audiences in dialogues about extremism and to promote tolerance in its place. The Balkans Project is directed at Bosnia and Kosovo. It's called Not In My Name. This is a clip from one of our videos that shows an imam in Kosovo pushing back at jihadists trying to attract young people to adventures abroad. Sisi skat bey me islam kurja, skat bey me botan arabe, as islam as nir zore, as je, hoj dora ar mejvet islamit, yada toka wa arabe, yada popli shiptar, jder yuki me thandar, nikini nevoj tashkani ati, se nuk kat bey me islam as je, pas me nir zi as je. Po e ka thonë edhe dhe zdojt me shku, s'kem qam e lypa tje, kem venit të bot mirë këto, tanat mirë ati kem, s'kem nevoj me shku as tjeri as kërkun. In Central Asia, there's a second project. Its languages are Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, and Russian. This is a trailer from part of the effort, a series of TV programs with studio audiences. We invited to the studio young people from Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan. Many of them, in this war, lost friends and acquaintances. And they don't want to say that this is not in the name of Allah. Это не от нашего имени. In these projects and in content for other regions across our geographies, we avoid getting into theological debates on whose interpretation of religion is the most authentic. We focus on respect for religiously inspired kindness and tolerance. For example, a widely viewed video about a Muslim minibus driver in southern Russia 
who often says, money tomorrow, today's ride is a good deed. We also pay a great deal of attention to the cost of terrorism to real families. This piece from Pakistan tells about wives still suffering from the loss of their husbands in a suicide bombing that took place years ago. We also cover the wrenching choices individual people face when confronted with extremism. This Tajik man turned in his own brother to the police for spreading jihadist ideas. Reaction to our projects has included strong support from moderates and predictable hostility from more radical groups. One wave of threatening messages to us in Bosnia followed a report of ours on 60 radical religious congregations in the country. We got some more blowback over a platform we opened on the occasion of Valentine's Day to discuss whether it's right to import holidays from other cultures and religions. We're trying to keep both the Balkan and Central Asia projects highly agile to engage audiences on relevant issues as soon as they come into the news. Turning to Russia, presidential elections are Sunday. There's no doubt who will win. You see him there, strong president, strong Russia. The other candidates have had trouble coming across as, well, head of state material. But the side stories to this election make for compelling journalism. Current Time and the RFERL Russian service have extensively covered the anti-corruption protests in dozens of cities during the campaign, protests largely ignored by official media. Uh, that's would-be candidate Alexei Navalny at a Moscow protest where he was arrested in January. We also reported on a social media get-out-the-vote commercial that some found had racist and homophobic overtones. In it, a man says there's no point in voting. Then he has a terrifying dream that his failure to vote brought in a government that wants to draft him into the army and send gay people to live at his house. Who's behind this commercial isn't clear, but turnout is perhaps the biggest challenge for Putin in these elections. On Sunday, all eyes will be on the numbers who go to the polls as a sign of how enthusiastic Russians are in giving him another six-year term. Current Time will be offering 15 hours of live TV coverage on Election Day and heavy coverage on the web and social networks. RFERL's Russian service will have a 24-hour radio and audio stream and additional web and social content. We have been very careful to cover all sides of the election. Um, if Putin wins, and that seems likely, our coverage will also have reflected why people support him and the strength that he has brought to his campaign and to the country. Thank you, Tom. Governor's questions, comments? All right, thank you. Moving on to Office of Cuba Broadcasting. Of course, it's always a challenge to get content onto the island. And uh, Andre Mendez, our acting director down there, has found some unique and creative ways to accomplish that. So Andre, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, governors, uh, distinguished guests. Um, I, I got to tell you first that I am just so proud to be running this organization. It has a long history uh, of fighting uh, the communist dictatorship. And the staff at Marti are just incredibly dedicated professionals that are upping OCB's game every single day. It has real, truly been amazing. Uh, the video that you will see highlights the accelerated progress that we have been engineering. Nothing short of spectacular and uh, all due to their embrace of change and progress, despite some of the commentaries about OCB staff that uh, you know, prevailed in the past. These are very, very dedicated people. 
from more frequencies to new programs, for a new distribution system that has Antenna Live, our flagship news program, available on the island literally 30 minutes after airing and available to thousands of Cubans before the regime's 8 o'clock noticiero, uh, the, it has been unbelievable. Uh, the distribution of all pro programming on all three platforms, radio, TV, and digital simultaneously, which we're starting on Monday, is also absolutely unprecedented and I think leading you know, most major organizations. Uh, you'll also see brief footage uh, of a remarkable event last week uh, when ex-presidents Pastrana and Quiroga were prevented from entering the island and were on the tarmac, on the phone with Alvaro Alba, one of our leading journalists, uh, relaying you know, a message to the Cuban people of hope, even as they were being literally kicked out of the country. Um, I could not be more proud of them and their work in bringing to what are really 11 million imprisoned Cuban people, the news and information that continue to be denied to them by the Castro communist dictatorship. Roll the video. The idea that somehow someone could conduct an attack so sophisticated that we don't even know what it is without the Cuban government at least knowing about it, it's ridiculous. If senior Cuban officials did not directly order these attacks, they must have been aware of or given tacit approval to foreign agents to operate in Cuba. Cuando yo veo elecciones libres, cuando yo veo los presos políticos liberados, cuando yo veo una prensa libre, cuando yo veo que el pueblo puede manifestarse con su opinión, sin golpes, sin tortura, sin arresto, es cuando vemos vamos a ver el cambio. ¿Cuál es su mensaje para los cubanos de la isla? Decirle al pueblo de Cuba y el grupo IDEA, los expresidentes elegidos democráticamente, estamos acompañando. Fraude y robo de identidad, así ha calificado los hechos. Like Oldsmobile says, this is not your father's OCB. <laughs> Governor's questions, comments? All right, thank you, Andre. So moving now to Radio Free Asia and Libby, um, as you know, and as Ms. Noonan noted in her uh, talk a minute ago, the rise in Chinese surveillance and imprisonment in the state of Xinjiang is getting worldwide attention. The reason it's getting worldwide attention is, is that there's only one news organization in the world that's covering it, and that's the Uyghur News Service at Radio Free Asia. Um, we, Libby and I, had a chance to sit down with some of the reporters over at Radio Free Asia whose families are being persecuted for this crime of them covering the story. And it was an incredibly emotional meeting for me and for them because they continue to get up every day and report this story knowing that it's putting their families in harm's way. 
That's how important this is. The scale of this story is amazing. Upwards from 800,000 to a million people in quote unquote education camps um, where God knows what is happening and uh, nothing is heard from them once they go into these camps. So Libby, I'll toss it over to you, but this is something that uh, is high on my radar in terms of priorities and uh, something that I want to make sure that we continue to support Libby and her work in this. So Libby, go ahead. Thank you, John. Um, so today I'm going to talk about just one in the myriad of uh, Chinese threats at play that are rolling out across the globe. The clip that I'm going to show today is a shortened example of the various video products that we've been producing about the Chinese use of AI and machine learning to advance their goal, really, of a complete surveillance state. You've probably seen pieces recently in um, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, WAPO, and elsewhere about the Chinese surveillance stage, which focuses on their experimental laboratory known to others as the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. It's there in, in the Tibet Autonomous Region where the CCP tries out its campaigns before rolling it across the country. In this clip, we're going to focus on uh, facial recognition, which is used there by a vast network of tens of millions of CCTVs. So let's play the clip. The development of facial recognition began over two decades ago in the United States. Today, this technology is being used to analyze facial features such as hair color, the proportions of the main parts of the face, and so on, to identify individual people. Due to the government's massive injections of funds, China's facial recognition technology leads the world by a large margin. Not only is it able to recognize individuals from recent photos, it can even identify people from old ones taken decades ago. SenseTime is a Chinese company that specializes in this technology. SenseTime's market value has already surpassed 200 million US dollars. Its market spans across a variety of business sectors such as retailers, banks, airports, etc. Yet its largest client is the Chinese government. If you regularly walk the streets around cities in China, you can almost definitely say that you are being closely monitored. Whether at road intersections, public subway systems, or in shops, banks, or residential areas, China currently already uses hundreds of millions of cameras that have been installed over many years, establishing the largest, most extensive video surveillance system in the world. And with its increasing powerful facial recognition and use of big data technology, China's huge monitoring system has grown even more powerful. Recently, U.S.-based Human Rights Watch exposed that the Chinese police are using big data to collect citizen information to crack down on so-called extreme dissidents, petitioners, and Uyghurs from southern Xinjiang. This so-called targets of stability maintenance worry as a result of facial recognition that they could face unfair circumstances more easily. There is nothing wrong with the rapid development of science and technology, but judging from the Chinese government's consistent ways of depriving human rights, how biological recognition technology is applied has become a matter of great concern to those in the industry. The latest legislation puts no restrictions on the government. Under China's system, there's no oversight mechanism for government activities. High-end technology as a result has also become a high-end tool for violating human rights. As you can see, we think it's, n it's very important not only to inform the domestic audience about what's happening, uh, but to counter the CCP rhetoric that this is all part of a very reasonable social contract between the government and its citizens. Videos like this allow um, the audience to both have reactions of, oh, wow, I didn't know that this is what this means, as well as, wow, somebody else feels the way I do. 
To this end, we're using our coverage of the experiments in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region with the almost, as John points out, one million Uyghur adults in re-education camps that are subjected to voice printing, face printing, mandatory device applications that to inform the larger and the, frankly, more important Han uh, population in China about what is going to come their way. Because the experiments, once they, once they are succeeding in Xinjiang and Tibet, they're rolled out across the country. Moreover, we're using this content to inform citizens in the countries that have governments that are basically well-paid for serfs to the CCP about what's coming their way, courtesy of the Chinese exportation of censorship and surveillance. Because RFA is the only Uyghur language news service in the world, we've been responsible for raising much of this to light into the world's attention. As um, people have mentioned today, in appreciation for the service, the government has engaged on an unconscionable intimidation campaign where they've swept up dozens of family members of our Uyghur journalists. Some of the immediate family members um, have been used before as hostages to silence our reporters. Um, when they have been in jail before, they've been made to call our reporters and to beg them to leave RFA, to come back to China, where they'll have jobs and big houses, etc. During those phone calls, we have recordings of Chinese security officers sitting in the background coaching the family members. We know that the family members and family, um, are they're brought in for interrogation, questioned repeatedly about our reporters. We know the Chinese government will persecute our people. We know that they will be forcibly separated from their families to do this work. But now dozens have disappeared or been jailed in the midst of the very purge of Uyghur people, culture, history, religion that we're reporting about. The elderly and the infirm are subject to inhumane treatment. And all of this is a form of psychological torture to intimidate our journalists. This has to end, but not on China's terms. They want to be able to systematically demonize and justify the purging of the Tibetan and the Uyghur people while mining the natural resources in those regions and paving the way for their one belt, one road drive across the continents. And they want to do this in the dark, as they have in the past. That is not going to happen while Radio Free Asia is here, and they know it. And that's why they're doing this. So I appreciate all the support that the board has given us. And I really hope that we can get these people released, or at least find out where they are. Thank you. I, I join with uh, Libby 100% in that statement. That all of us on the board do. We're, we're, it, it is mind-boggling what is happening to uh, the families of our hardworking, courageous journalists. And I, all of us are also deeply grateful to the Committee for the Protection of Journalists, to Reporters Without Borders, to see you. SIB and others who are highlighting uh, this unconscionable action by the uh, government of China. Any other governor's comments, questions? All right, thank you, Libby. So uh, Alberto Fernandez, our president at Middle East Broadcasting Networks, Sawa and Al Hura, is now about eight or nine months in, I believe. Alberto, is that right? Eight. Eight. <laughs> and. Uh, let me just say that he hit the ground running, and his first instinct was to sharpen the tip of the spear so that MBN networks were having maximum impact in the region that he covers. And he's gotten to the point now where he's ready to launch a couple of new programs that really define the approach and strategy that he's laying out for MBN. And uh, I couldn't be more pleased with the direction. So Alberto, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Governors. Um, the transformation process at uh, Middle East Broadcasting Networks, which we launched uh, some months ago, is picking up pace now in terms of tangible change in the form of new programming that presents unapologetic, energetic, classically enlightenment values that are so often denied or marginalized in the, in the Arabic-speaking Middle East. Um, we have a series of programs that we're launching, but the first two, coincidentally, are launching this week. Uh, the first one launches tomorrow. Bain Samwa Ahmad is a fast-paced, fresh, sharp commentary on current events and the news in the region, hosted by Hudson Institute scholar and Hoover Institution scholar Sam Tadros and Syrian human rights activist Ahmad Abdul Hamid. On Sunday... Um, after that, we have uh, another show which goes deep 
into issues related to controversy in the reg region on political and ideological issues, especially those related to political Islam and jihadism, with the well-known uh, um, Egyptian uh, scholar, journalist, novelist, and all-around gadfly, Ibrahim al-Isa, well-known critic of Islamism and jihadism. First clip, please. Samar Ammar, take three. محمد بن سلمان هل يحمل مشروع حقيقي للتغيير في السعودية التي لم تشهد تغييرا أم هو مجرد شخص يريد الوصول إلى السلطة وإلى كرسي الحكم بوتين لازم يفهم روسيا ما لا الاتحاد السوفيتي هو ما له ستالين يعني ما 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 حاول هذا هذا حجم جديد من الاعراب في السياسه ما فيش صداقات دائمه او عداوات دائمه التقسيم حيطال البلد وسيطال بشار الاسد بمرحله ما من من المراحل اهلا بكم في حلقه جديده من مختلف علي الدين الإسلامي في بؤرة الاتهام بإشاعة الرعب والإرهاب في العالم هو أهم حاجة بالنسبة له القتل 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 يظهر كالعادة في كل لحظة وفي كل منعطف وفي كل منحنى حراس العقيدة على طول عصف اتهام تكفير ثم الأهم من ده كله بقى أنا اللي أملك الحقيقة اليقين عندي أنا أنا اللي عارف أنتوا مش عارفين أنا اللي مؤمن وأنتوا مش مؤمنين And of course, not uh, not ignoring the traditional work of um, of news gathering. Uh, late last year, Al Hura Television (MBN) was the first Pan Arab network to have a uh, lengthy interview with National Security Advisor McMaster, and we followed that up with um, the, being the first Pan Arab network to have a uh, similar interview with uh, Secretary of State Tillerson uh, last month. I think we're going to also be the first one to have an interview with Secretary of State Pompeo um, <laughs> as well. Uh, second clip, please. We are still there in Iraq today to continue to ensure that ISIS-Daesh cannot reemerge. Iran's in influence inside of Syria is not positive. It is negative because they bring with it instability, they bring with it violence. The will of the Syrian people and restoring a free, whole, democratic and independent Syria that will result in them rejecting outside interference from Iran. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Ambassador Crocker. Uh, thanks, and thank you for all of that. I, I would just like to point out that um, uh, you're, you're overly modest. Uh, uh, Al Alberto, for many years, but now especially in your capacity as uh, CEO for MBN, uh, is, is taking the fight uh, to the region. Uh, uh, Ambassador Fernandez is uh, the finest non-native Arab speaker in the Foreign Service. And he does not hesitate to use it. Uh, getting on Al Jazeera fairly frequently, Alox Bilox, uh, <laughs> you'd think a glass of water was rough stuff? Uh, try those guys. Uh, but but, but uh, for that region to have <coughs> you there, not just running an organization, but being the uh, kind of the face of America, uh, speaking better Arabic than many of them, is uh, invaluable. Thank you. Any other governors? A really superficial comment. Just the modern look of those opinion shows at the beginning and the use of humor, and it just is a very appealing, fresh packaging. Uh, the sarcasm is just terrific. It feels very, very fresh. Thank you very much. I mean, that's the goal, is we want to have something which was, you know, you always have the danger of talking heads in current affairs shows. And there, you can't get away from that 
thing, but uh, certainly to try to make it different than other talking head shows that you see in a saturated pan-Arab environment is the way to go. Okay, so as you can see from uh, VOA's edition of Greta all the way to Alberto down the line, the ICC is breaking new ground every time we meet, and uh, I'm very pleased with the first-rate quality of everybody leading our networks. And Greta, once again, welcome to the team. And that's our report. Thank you, CEO Lansing. And I want to thank all of the ICC members and Greta Van Susteren for those uh, incredible and inspiring reports. Uh, are there any questions from the governors for John or for the ICC? OK, well, there being none, let me just note the next board meeting will be held here at BBG headquarters on June 6, 2018. I will work closely with my fellow governors and CEO Lansing to develop the agenda. For the meeting, I want to encourage the governors to give uh, me, CEO Lansing, or BBG staff input on the topics that you wish for us to address at the next meeting. Uh, let me ask if uh, any governor wish to move to adjourn the meeting. Ambassador Cornblue moves to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Great. Governor Kumpner beat out uh, <laughs> the other ambassador by a second there. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, let me uh, thank everyone. This concludes the formal board meeting of uh, the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Thank you very much. Thank you.